go to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 in your Bible. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Okay. New Testament near the end of the book. Amen. It's there. Okay. 2 Peter chapter 1. And uh, I'm, I'm going to do this this morning. I usually don't do this. I'm going to preach the entire book of 2 Peter. Okay. Uh, the only thing is it's going to be abbreviated, but we're going to read chapter 1 and, uh, and, and we'll look at a few things from the other two chapters. It's, it's, it's kind of brief, but uh, that it, it goes together. So you, you could preach a part and, uh, and it would be helpful. But there's some things along with this because the entire, uh, the entirety of this, of this little book is that Peter's writing to Christians, uh, that they would remember some things. Put things in remembrance. Um, he said some of the things he's addressing and what he says to them, they know already, but he wants to tell them anyway, once again. He wants them to remember because Peter's like some other people, you know, Peter repeats himself because he wants them to remember some things. And that's what Second Peter is about. And I thought about this, you know, because uh, I don't know, maybe you didn't bother yesterday about remembering 9-11 yesterday. Uh, stop for a few minutes, at least pause, give some thought. Uh, it might have enraged you. It might made you feel sorry and uh, uh, be have grief, you know, a sense of grief. Maybe still a sense of loss. Maybe you know somebody that knows somebody that lost somebody. Uh, it's hard to believe it was 20 years ago, uh, what happened in New York City. I remember, uh, remember Dick Gavin used to live in the house over here where uh, Chuck and Sue live, where they got the fence up. And he had cancer. He had mouth cancer, tongue cancer. And he was in the University of Penn. And I told him when he goes, gets his surgery, he really didn't want to do that, but, but he did. And, uh, and, uh, he was at the University of Penn and I was driving that, that morning, 9-11 that morning up 95 and I got near the airport and, you know, they've got the signs over, you know, electronic signs over the road and said, Lower Manhattan is closed. And it's like, you know, uh, I was like, why in the world would Lower Manhattan be closed like 8.30 in the morning or 9 o'clock in the morning? And uh, me, because because usually when I drive, I should say you, most of the time when I drive, I'm doing something else. I'm praying. I'm praying. I pray a lot because you know if I'm driving to do whatever, uh, that give me gives me some time usually to be alone. Uh, I do not close my eyes when I pray when I'm driving, just to let you know. And uh, you know, so I try to be careful. And and I was praying, so I never thought to like to turn on the radio. And uh, when I got in to see him and I was walking down the hall, you know, everybody's crowded in the lounge areas and the waiting areas and the TV's got all the disaster on. And that's how I was introduced to what happened that day. So so regardless of what you think about uh, who did that, how it came about and all that, it's still a tragedy to our country for a lot of different reasons. And uh, Lord willing, at least you took a moment or two uh, to remember what took place. Uh, to thank God for what you still have, even though we, we, uh, we've got a lot of issue with some things that are not very good in our land right now, but, um, but that you took the time um, to remember that. And, I, and I'm glad, uh, it doesn't seem like the entire country did, but, but, I, but I'm glad that still it was designated, we're going to remember what happened and the people we lost and the public servants we lost and all that on that day of such great tragedy. Because uh, sometimes if you don't take time to remember, guess what? You won't. Uh, it might be in the back of your mind, maybe floating around somewhere sometimes, but, but it never comes to the forefront. You know, it, it, it's, it's never there where you stop a couple of minutes. Let's, let's remember this. And um, so, so I, I hope you did just in reflection. Uh, there's a lot of evil in the world. And uh, that is true. And it's, it's incredible, incredibly... Um, I don't know what you call it. It's not amazing, but it's incredibly um, sad, I guess the word is. Uh, the inhuman things humans do to one another. Let's leave it at that. How's that? You know? So anyway, so, so thank God you still live in a land that's sort of free. And uh, you're sort of protected, sort of secure. And uh, that we don't live like an awful lot of the rest of the world does. Uh, we're grateful for that. But anyway, so I thought about with remembrance, it, it, this is not how I came to think about Second Peter, what I want to share with you. 
but he, he wants, wants these people you write to the, to remember some things. Second Peter 1, verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to the glory, to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, the wrong sinful desires, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins or his old way of life, sinful way of life before Christ. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for you do these things, ye shall never fall. That doesn't mean lose your salvation. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Yeah, I think it be as long as I am in this tabernacle or in his physical body to stir up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. The end of the book of John. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For if we have not followed, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, and there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye Take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place unto the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. This is talking about the Old Testament prophets and the written word of God, the Old Testament written down. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were what? Moved by the Holy Ghost. Heavenly Father, we'd ask your blessing upon the reading of your word to us today. We're grateful for our Bibles that we had before us in September 2021. We pray that you'd help us to, uh, to open this Bible and read, read it. Help us not to be so concerned about how much we read, but that we do. And that we actually uh, think about what it is that we're reading. Pray about it. Learn about it. And if it applies to us directly, that you would help us to live it by your power and grace. Well, we're thankful for what we have here today before us. We pray this sermon time would be helpful and profitable to us uh, and would do you honor also. And we pray, Holy Spirit, now that you'd help us to be attentive and receptive to what the Lord God has for us today. In your name, Lord, we pray. Amen. So let's talk about remembrance because you it's in the first chapter. I don't know how many times about remembrance. Let's talk about remembrance. And let me ask you this, you know, and you don't necessarily have to answer. If you want to, that's OK. Uh, if you give a wrong answer, that's that's OK. And maybe that's what you remember. And so maybe it's not wrong for you. But what do you remember about Peter? Not the Apostle Paul. We used to talk about Apostle Paul because he's so dominant in the New Testament. But but what do you remember? What do you remember about the Apostle Peter? Now, there's three things. There's three things that I wrote down that I think most people, like if I could call you the run-of-the-mill Christian, can I say that? Run-of-the-mill Christian, if I could say it that way. 
listen, that, that they, they usually remember about the Apostle Peter. Number one, Robbie, number one. He was given a new name. I didn't write that down, but that's right. He was given a new name. Yeah, because his, it's in my sermon notes. I'll get ahead of myself. Yeah, because his name is what? His name was what? Simon. Simon. He is the brother of, or was the brother of Andrew. Remember? Andrew found Christ. He goes and tells his brother Simon that, that, that Messiah is here. Okay. Yeah. Anything else about the Apostle Peter that you remember. Anything else? So you had a new name, and Peter. Yeah, you, you might as well go ahead, Robbie. Nobody else is like everybody else is dozed off already. He's what? Yes, I had. I did have that one written down. I'm a run of mill Christian too. I I have it written down. Yeah, he denied Christ three times. Three times. So I'll get ahead of. I just minute, hold on. He denied Christ three times, right? Three times. He swore he would never deny Christ. Remember, he swore his loyalty. He swore that he would even face death, go to death for the cause of Christ and loyalty to Christ, and he would never deny him. And the Lord said, listen, before the cock crows, you know, in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. He said, no, I won't. You know, listen, listen, if, if the Lord speaks to you, you know, get on board and don't argue with him. Amen. <coughs> Yeah, and, and what a shame, but he did. He did do that. Yes, Peter, what do you remember? Uh, he did a lot of speaking before thinking. Yes, he did, a lot, he did a lot of speaking before thinking. None of us are like that, okay? But he was, you know? And uh, do you have a, for instance, that, that you, you, that's in your mind about that or uh, just the general fact that, yes, he did very often, yeah. He, uh, he did that. And most of the time when he did that, he was uh, kind of off base a little bit, you know, that kind of thing, and had to back up. Uh, he's backed up some. Yeah, he did it both negatively and positively. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was not biased at all. He took care of both ends of the spectrum. Yeah, he did. That's true. Yeah, Paul. Uh, he did something kind of flashy. Yes, I did write that one down. Yes, I, I had, right, he walked on water and, uh, you know, and uh, didn't Kenyon West walk on water in one of his videos, his Christian videos, but he had something to walk on underneath the water. Yeah, I, but check that out, you know. You think I don't know anything. I know a few things. Anyway, yeah, he did walk on water. That's right, he did. He walked on water, amen? He walked on water, yeah. That's true. And none of us ever done that, have you? No. Okay. Anything else about Apostle Peter? Oh, wait. We got. Uh, you should. We uh, we're deferring to your mother first. Is that right? Okay. Go ahead, Denise. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Is that Matthew sixteen? That's Matthew. Is that Matthew sixteen or eighteen, Karen? I think it's sixteen. Is it sixteen? That's what I think. Yeah. Okay. What else, Laura? What do you got? Um, he cut off on his ear. He cut off. That's right. Yeah, because he was, he was always like. That's right. He did in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah, lopped that baby right off. Yeah, trying to defend, uh, defend Christ and the, uh, the other apostles. That's right. Yes. Yeah, you yeah, that that is true. You're right about that. Yeah, he actually did. Yes, he did. Yeah, anything else? If we keep going, you know, you guys got like like 23 minutes. Keep going. Yeah. He was crucified Yeah, he was yes. Yeah, at the end of his life, yeah, it it, it as far as tradition because we don't don't have a lot about his death, but uh it, they think yes, he he was crucified head down. Uh to show more humility and not even be crucified like Christ was. Uh, that's how he met a martyr's death, and that's in my notes too about, you know, that's what happened to him. Uh, that's actually about uh, 66 AD, and he was about 66 years old. And uh, when that happened, and he knows he's soon he's going to be executed, it's in my notes, and that's why he said my departure is shortly going to happen. And, uh, and he wants 
them to remember some of these things, these Christian believers. Yeah, that's, he did do that. That is, that is true. Under that famous emperor, the psychopath, Roman Caesar, Nero. Yes. Yes. Wasn't somebody else uh, put to death under Nero too? That we all know and love? Yeah, Apostle Paul. Yeah, that's right. Yep. And uh, that was off with his head. Yep. Anything else? Then we're going to go on. Any, Paul. That's like right. He must have been a really good one because a lot of some of the other religions who have saved him that he's the same he's the same of this because of yes. he has to do with fishing. So it's yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah, it's a patron saying of yeah, that's right, yeah. That's true. And uh Ron. Uh, he didn't really want to preach to the Gentiles. He'd say that you're soft spoken. He really didn't want to preach to the Gentiles. He didn't want yes, he had trouble making that adjustment. Uh, that that is true that that is, that's true yeah and I'll say a little bit about that you know because he had the keys to open the doors um, uh, to the Jews to the Samaritans Acts 8 and to the Gentiles Acts 10 that's right and, and when he saw the vision he had a hard time with that saying Lord you know I've always practiced my Judaism right to a T you know, this did, we don't think anything over this about the Gentiles, you know, and being whatever, but, but it was a real issue back then about the gospel uh, going to people who were not Jewish people. And not only that, they're believing, they're trusting Christ, they're getting born again. You know, that, that is true. One more thing, anything else you got on your mind? You get, you get it all cleared up and we'll go on. I have one other thing that I have written down. That, that uh, I had three things written down in case you guys didn't have anything, but evidently you feel like talking this morning. So go ahead. Anybody else? One more thing. Cameron. He was part of like the main three. Yes, he was, he was the, the inner three, I guess, the inner circle three. And the other two were? James and John. That's right. Those three, they were the inner circle. I mean, the Lord had favorites. Yeah, but you used the wrong word. Uh, they were there for specific reason, purpose. Uh, they were close to the Lord for certain reasons. And yes, the inner three. And uh, the other thing I had written down about Peter, uh, that you remember, he ain't no pope. He's not. You know, I, I know we have an Argentinian uh, Pope now, maybe you do. I don't. But but listen, listen. I, I understand that. We understand that he's a Marxist socialist type of person. We understand that. Okay. But Peter was no Pope. Uh, Peter was married. We know the Popes in the Middle Ages. They were married for a while, and then there were issues, and they made him swear to celibacy. But anyway, uh, Peter was no Pope. Peter was married. Peter was married. Peter was Jewish. Peter was Jewish. And Peter, Paul told us, Peter was a fisherman, right? And, uh, and even in our text, we see that, that uh, though he was no pope, he was a servant of Jesus Christ in the first verse. He's also an apostle of Jesus Christ, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, uh, and if you read 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, he says that he's also an elder, an elder in the Christian faith. He's an elder like the elders he was writing to. He wasn't above them. He was equal with them. He was an elder like they were. Okay? But not Pope. Okay? And uh, it's also interesting about, about, uh, about Peter, what I say when you, when you see what he says about these things, about he's an elder and uh, he's a servant and those type of things. He's, he's also this. He was, he was of the common faith. What are you talking about? Jude was going to, going to write about false prophets, but he, he needed to write about defending the common faith, the, the faith, the Christian faith. He was of the common faith of the Christian faith, the same common faith that his audience had that is precious and obtained through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We already said this, and Cameron filled in some of this, and Paul, and uh, listen about Peter. He's Andrew's brother, Simon. He was loud, and he seemed to be the lead. He seemed to be the lead with the, 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 the apostles or disciples. He's in the inner circle, like we said. 
He was told by the Lord Jesus because he said, you ain't going to no cross. You're not going to get slain. Listen, they're not going to take your life. We're not going to let this happen. You ain't going to Jerusalem. And, and Christ told Peter, get behind me. What? Satan. Satan. For thou savorest not the things that of God, but of, of men. What, God, what men want outside the will of God, that's what the devil wants. That's why he's so slick. That's why you don't see him all the time in what he's doing and what he tempts you with. He's also the recipient of that question, the end of John. You know, after the resurrection, he was gone fishing. The Lord said, you know, he denied Christ. He goes fishing and uh, he knows about the resurrection. He saw the empty tomb and he saw Christ, but he, he's fishing. And you know about Christ on the shore. He has dinner for them. And everything's going great. Man, we're with the Lord. We're in fellowship. We're having, you know, fish and Fish and, they don't do fish and chips. They weren't British. Fish and chips, whatever they're having. And, uh, and while they're eating, everything is fine. All of a sudden, the Lord's got to start, start up, you know, and has to address Peter. He was the recipient of that question three times. Do you love me? And Peter's almost grieved with a little bit of sorrow the third time. He said, Lord, you know I love you. He said, feed my sheep. It's also interesting about Peter, you know, he's got a transformed life uh, at the resurrection of Christ and the Lord restores him. So by the time you get into Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, he's, he's the lead preacher. There's 3,000 people saved. All in one day. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Incredible. Listen, remember Apostle Peter? He was in jail. Herod put him in jail and intended to take him out and execute him. Okay, the next day, remember he's sleeping in the jail? chained to the guards people are at, at a particular house and they're praying for peter peter's release overnight and it actually happened the angel of the lord came and said come on let's go you're a free man go preach again in the temple so so you had that miraculous jailbreak happen he thought he was dreaming but it was real remember that he was also rebuked by the apostle paul Remember Galatians, you know, listen, we're not under law anymore, you know, and so, so let's get on board and don't, don't live like a, a legalistic Jew when the Gentile believers aren't around, you know, and, and then when they're there, you're with the Gentile believers, but now the Jews are putting so much pressure on you, you're, you're separating from the Gentile believers, you're living like a legalistic Jew again. Apostle Paul rebuked him. It's also interesting when you read about what Peter writes. It's interesting. Apostle Peter uh, states that he he is in full, as he's writing uh, to believers, he, he's saying, it, he states he's in full agreement with the Apostle Paul. They're both on the same page. Even though Peter Peter was a an apostle to the, to the Jews and Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. The time of our text is around 66 AD. We already mentioned this, that he's a prisoner of the Roman government, and he is certain that very, very soon he would put off this earthly tabernacle, okay, and becomes deceased and separated from this world. If I can say it this way, and I'm not being disrespectful, on his way out, on his way out, Okay. He's remembering. He's remembering something. Now, I thought about that. If you were going to be executed and uh, you wind up being crucified head down, I, I wonder what you would be thinking about as the hour fast approached. What he is thinking about, what he is remembering, or who he's remembering, he's remembering other believers. He's remembering their persecution, their sufferings. The churches were being persecuted from time to time. The Christians were being persecuted and suffering because of this Christian belief that they had. In the area of Asia Minor, the, the major country is Turkey there. It's happening back then. And before his execution, being crucified upside down, he's, he's remembering others. 
He's remembering others and what is best to lead them with. He could be remembering a lot of other things. But it's interesting, he's remembering other believers and in, in the context of what's best to lead them with. Here he's still acting, he's still feeding the sheep. Remember, back then, the Lord going to feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He's still doing that right up to his execution. He's remembering others. What's best to lead them with? What would be the best things? And what he does in our at the beginning in the chapter one, you know, uh, there's a, there's a charge to remember what he has said by way of his written letter. Because remember, back then, you know, you're not calling anybody on the phone, you're not shooting them an email or anything like that. They're going to remember what he said by way of the letter that he wrote. Them. And it's interesting; he wants them to remember some things, regardless of the times that they're living in, regardless of the troubles that they're experiencing, regardless of the testings that they're going through. He wants to remember some things, even though they're experiencing trials in their lives and they're living under cruel tyrants sometimes, okay? That there's a, there's a real threat to life, limb, uh, your welfare, your livelihood, and all those kind of things. Regardless of these things, he, he wants them to remember, okay? That when the days got to the point where it was looked like it was just too much to endure, when it looked like it was the, the experience is way beyond me, I can't do this, I can't do this, he still wanted them to remember some things. And he begins by, he wants them to remember that God has given them what was needed to escape the corruption that's in the world due to man's evil desires. Now, the idea about escaping the corruption is the idea of how you live your life. You don't have to live your life like the sinful world lives its life. That's what he's talking about. Because they still experience sinful things. They still were, the, uh, uh, were persecuted. They still were given grief. There was a certain lifestyle the pagans lived and an awful lot of it was immoral, not good at all. He said, you, you don't have to live like that. You can live like a child of God. He said he wanted them to remember that their Christianity, if you read chapter one, where you add, add to your faith this and virtue and all those intemperance or self-control and all those things, it, it, it's interesting. He wanted them to remember that, that their Christianity was to be lived not just in word, but in their works, their actual lives. He wanted their, 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 the, the embodiment of their life and how it's lived and how, how they walk, worked every day and that, that, that the Christianity is not just in your words, but actually in your works, what you do, in your deeds, even in your attitude, your disposition. It's interesting also in the chapter that he wanted them to re remember that, that they, they were to anchor their lives to the words of God. That's what you have as you draw a conclusion near the end of the chapter. Anchor their lives in the words of God that were spoken by true, genuine, authentic men of God, even the apostles, true preachers and teachers, and that they would be sure to remember the already written word of God in their lives. And that was given by holy men of God that were moved by the Holy Ghost, inspired by the Holy Ghost, the words of God.
And then we're not going to read chapter two because I don't have that much time. You guys talk too much during the sermon time. So, so I have to hurry. Okay. And then chapter two. So he wants to remember these, these good things. Okay. In chapter one. That are really important that, that you live out your Christianity in word and deed, even though you're being persecuted, even though you have trials, even though there's difficulties and sometimes you're ruled by cruel tyrants, we, you still you still live out your Christianity. Remember to do that. Anchor your life, your soul to the word of God that you would hear from true authentic preachers and teachers, the apostles. Good things. But in chapter 2, he reminds them that, listen, there's going to be false teachers and preachers that are going to infiltrate the church. It's interesting. I wonder why you would want to infiltrate the church when their church is being persecuted, the Christians are suffering. It doesn't like, but evidently that was the case. He, he wants them to remember uh, uh, the warning he's given them that there will be false prophets among the churches. And then he explains that that's nothing new. There were false prophets in the Old Testament too. When God gave the word, there were false prophets that stepped up and said, listen to me and follow me instead of God. In chapter 2, it's explained. He explains to them, you need to remember this about false prophets, false teachers. He said, you have to remember they're self-motivated. They're not called by God. They're self-motivated. They have, for lack of a better word for now, they have motor mouths. Uh, they can speak really well. Man, they just got it right out of their mouth and away it goes. Uh, and, but they're not much, if any good at all. They're not much, if any good at all. Uh, they will make merchandise of you. In other words, they're not like shepherds, okay, that take care of God's flock, make merchandise of you. In other words, they'll take advantage of believers if they can reel them in for their own purposes, have their own followings. Abuse them with false doctrine. Abuse them with giving them false hope. Abuse them by, by deceiving them and teaching lies that they consume and they, they become, uh, uh, more, more involved and obsessed with that than even the false teacher is. And they make audacious claims as they live adulterous lives. That doesn't mean they're in adultery in a situation like with a woman or with a man. It, it means that they're unfaithful. There's no faithfulness in them to God or his word. There's no faithfulness to Christ in their lives. And he tells them, even though that's how it will be, and I'm warning you to be on the lookout for that, he said, I want you to remember that one day they'll be judged by God. They'll be judged by God. They'll be judged by God for their errors, for their evils, and extravagant, pride-filled ways. And this is what he's telling them we want you to avoid. There are some things we want you to remember in chapter 1 and we want you to embrace. In chapter 2 he's saying there are, there, there, there's, there's false prophets and teachers, listen, that are trying to get a crowd for themselves. They want to take advantage of you, even shake you down for money. You can read about it. It's in the chapter. He said, but what I want you to do is this. I want you not to embrace these kind of people. I want you to avoid them. I want you also, uh, there's other scriptures also that announce them. In other words, identify them. If you know they're not of God, you know they're not true, you know they're false, they're fake, they're pretend. He said, you should not, you should not leave your, your fellow Christian to the wolves. You should identify them. So other believers know who they are. You should avoid them, announce them. You should never accommodate them so you don't become acclimated to them, their beliefs, and how they live and what they want. And then the last thing is chapter 3. So you've got some things. Remember to embrace this. You've got some things in chapter 2. Remember what to avoid. Okay. Then what he does in chapter three, let's remember a little bit of, remember you have some hope. Remember you have some hope. 
I don't know about you, from time to time, even as a Christian, maybe, you know, I think this happens. I don't, I don't know if it's frequent, but I, 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 I know it happens. I, I think it really happens from time to time, even believers, especially if you're being persecuted, you have trials, there's difficulties, you're ruled by tyrants. Listen, things keep squeezing you and squeezing you and you feel in pressure. You feel you're getting boxed into a corner. You feel, uh, like, like you, you are, you are the demon because you express truth and the love of Christ and what is moral, what is right, the gospel meant. You know, that, that kind of thing. You, you might feel like you're in a hopeless situation. We all need to be reminded of the hope we have in Christ. And that's what he does in chapter 3. He wants them to remember this about the Lord Jesus, that one day he'll return. One day he'll return. Okay? He will return. That day is now talking about him returning in power and great glory. His second coming, which is in phases and covers a number of things, but here he says he's going to return. Power, great glory. This return is, is, is the phase of it, the part of it. You read Matthew 24 and 25, Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through the end of the chapter. He will return. And he says, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter the disbelief about the return of Christ. It doesn't matter about the criticisms about the return of Christ. It doesn't matter about the indifference people have when you mention the return of Christ. It doesn't matter that his long patience, God's long patience in this matter of the return of Christ, it, it's, it might come across and seem like it's, it's an empty promise. It's a ridiculous thing that just isn't going to happen, can't happen, won't happen. God's not interested. He just spouted off something. He really didn't mean it anyway. He said, don't worry about that off. He said, the truth of the matter is, the Lord will return. I want you to remember that. And why he's not back yet? Because he's long-suffering toward people. Because he's not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. Because the Lord is patient because he wants people to be saved, to come to Christ. And he tells them, when the Lord returns, there'll be judgment and justice will be served. Don't we all want that sometimes, you know? Uh, you know, and uh, it says that the Lord will make all things new. So he told them, you, you need to remember this. There, there's some hope here. Christ is going to return. And listen, he's going to make all things new after he judges the world and its sin and its sinful people. And, uh, and actually, he's going to make a new heavens and a new earth because the old ones are going to be burned up. And he said, everything is going to be new. And that's where righteousness will dwell. Isn't that what we want in life? A little bit of righteousness. And then he says that, that famous verse you know. You guys look about that famous verse you know, okay, as he's saying, remember this, hope you have, Christ will return one day and make all things new, and righteousness will dwell there. And you won't have to worry about persecution anymore. You won't have to worry about the trials. You won't ha have to worry about the sufferings anymore. You won't experience those things. The Lord will return. Make all things new where righteousness will dwell. And he said, until his return, though, until his return is that, is that and be careful how you live. And really, this verse has to do, be careful how you live. Live like you're in Christ. Okay? Live with eternity in view, with the Lord's return in view. He sums it up with that verse 18 of chapter 3. But for now, for now, grow in grace. Grow in grace. Okay? Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be both glory now and forever. Amen. So I don't know what you'll remember from this sermon. Maybe you'll remember some of the good comments from the congregation about the Apostle Peter. But I'd also like you to remember this. That, that you would anchor 
anchor your life to the Word of God. To the Word of God. And that you would remember this, that your Christianity is not just in your declarations or in your words, but it's to be lived out in your life, in your works. And that you would remember, regardless of what your situation is or your condition is, it's the right time to live for Christ. Would you remember that? And true preachers and true teachers will feed you the word of God. We can't talk about remembering those false preachers but at all costs avoid them. Whatever else you have going on in life, listen, there's a real hope that the Lord will return one day. It's a promise. It will come to pass. You know, I, I'm not so sure I like the verse because in chapter 3, like halfway through the chapter, it says like, like uh, you know, one of uh, a day is like, uh, or, or one of the Lord's days is like a thousand years in our time. I was like, geez, come on. Couldn't say like one of the Lord's days is like like ten minutes in our time. Maybe that would that would help us, you know. But it but it was going to happen. It'll happen. So live with that hope. Everything's going to be all right in the end. Everything's going to be good in the end. God will straighten out the messes and all this deal with all the sin and Satan. We'll have a new heaven, new earth. Righteousness will dwell there. Until then, grow in grace into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Let's sing.